Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, Mr. Powell for appearing. Now, uh, wars have historically been associated with elevated levels of inflation worldwide, <clears throat> although the relationship is complicated and wars can have impacts on both supply and demand. Higher inflation may just be one of the many prices that the humanity pays for the decision to go to war. Now, we don't have boots on the ground, but there's no doubt that in terms of supply disruption and military spending, both Europe and the U.S. are effectively at war in support of the freedom of the people of Ukraine. So my question is, um, is the 2% inflation target a realistic and appropriate goal during a time when much of the world is effectively at war? Or should the 2% goal be thought of as a goal for normal times, with policies being put in place that will return to 2% when the war is over, and, and, or at least when we've decoupled adequately from the Russian economy? 2% is our goal, and it will remain our goal. Uh, it's a medium-term goal, so uh, you know we, we're using our tools to get the infl inflation level back down to 2%. We're not considering changing it because of the war in Ukraine, and I, I don't know that that's playing a particularly important role in inflation today, although when, when energy prices and commodity prices went up at the beginning of the war, it certainly was. Yeah, well, and, and certainly it's an important factor for Europe still. Yes. The, the disruption particularly. Well, just more generally, you have been trying to deal with this question of how you balance the, your dual mandate. And so whenever you're trying to optimize simultaneously two different things, the first step is to put them into common units. Uh, so just to be specific here, um, let's say that you're missing your, you know, your unemployment goal by 1% and you're missing your inflation goal by 1% in the opposite direction. You know, at, at some point, uh, do, do those two cancel? Is 1% in one goal equivalent to 1% in the other? Or is it, do you need a 2% uh, missing of, of the unemployment target? Um, how, how does you, you know, what are the, I guess this must be implicitly, there must be that coefficient there in the Taylor rule and things like this that try to predict your behavior. But what, internally, how do you view the difference between a 1% um, unemployment missing of the target versus a 1% so of inflation? The Taylor, Taylor rule is a pretty good place to start there. Same coefficient on, on both variables. Now, is that really true? I, I don't know, I'd have to go look at it. In the original Taylor rule. Okay, but, um, because it, it's not an, it's a coincidence if the coefficient is one, because you could choose a quarterly inflation target or an annual or a decadal inflation target numerically and get very different numbers. So it's, it's also, there, there's a um, significant amount of research about, you know, the uh, relative social costs of inflation and unemployment, and you, you wouldn't want to ignore that research either. So I, I, I think, um, There'll be a lot of judgment in this. At, you know, at the current moment, it's not a question because we're obviously the labor market could, is extraordinarily strong, and we're very far from our, our inflation target. So, yeah, we but well, you're getting conflict. complaints from business that the labor market may be too tight. You know, there yeah. at least it's viewed from the Taylor Rule point of view that there is a penalty that you pay when the unemployment gets too small. There is a target you're trying to hit. But both okay. sides, and, and both sides both are sides, calling right. for for tight policy, though. Um, um, yes, that is great at present, but there, you know, you can certainly foresee times when they will be in tension, and they historically have been. And so you're you're saying that pretty much it's a one percent on both. That you take. I think you that's a starting the, place. I, I I think it doesn't lend itself to uh, to that level of precision. Yeah. Well, it's either that or you have to face questions like you've been facing for the last decade, <laughs> in and just how do you balance this? I, yeah. um, Let's see, in, in terms of the um, internet or electronic runs on banks, it seems like that's a new thing that's going to have to inform um, inform bank capital and liquidity uh, providers. The, the first question is, if you get a significant uh, electronic run on a significant size bank, is there anyone but the Federal Reserve that can provide that emergency assistance? Or do you pretty much have to be the, the only line of defense against the big internet runs? Well, I, th I think... Regulation and supervision can play a role in in that as well, and that's in stopping the run from starting, right? But yes. if you, but part of that stopping the run from starting is know that knowing that if it starts, that there is someone or some entity that can stop it. We're the lender of last resort, and that's that is something that only the central bank can be or do. But I wouldn't. I would say changes to regulation to assure that there's that you don't have this mismatch between runnable liabilities and 
and available cash to fund their running, that's, that's something we can address and will address through regulation and supervision. Thank you.